all right so in today's class we will look into uh, deep learning the basics of you know deep learning aspects we will uh, slowly move into ann which is artificial neural network and what are the different types of you know neural networks which we have how neural networks work you know uh, what are the different types of uh, neural networks which we have and their applications and we'll see some you know small case studies wherein these neural networks are used and as i said you know uh, the overview will be just you know scratching the surface and then we'll move on to the next level of optimizers and activation functions and so on so we'll start from here we have a neural network we have artificial neural network we have convolutional neural network which is called cnn and we have recurrent neural network which we call it rnn right so let's see what is neural network now neural network is based on a collection of connected units or nodes called neurons so we all know that you know we have neurons inside our body right we have uh, to also understand one thing that our entire body process you know works with neurons as the backbone architecture so uh, we have our central nervous system and then central nervous system is composed of neurons and these neurons you know talk to each other send signals to each other and this is how we work so even if you want if you touch a surface which is hot or cold the entire sensation actually works through the neurons in the background right because it is all connected through our brains and our central nervous system right so this is this is the thing which neural network right so nowadays you know all these new technologies which we are using are using you know neural networks so what's really happening is we are trying to mimic a human behavior or a human uh neural architecture inside a, a real world you know artificial product or entity so that's why our neural network when it gets transformed to a you know object it becomes a artificial neural network right why it is called artificial because we are artificially injecting those or we are trying to replicate those inside a artificial object like a self driving car so we have we all have cars right or or our family has a car or our friends have our car or, or or they have their own car now these cars are nothing but you know automobiles which were working with the help of a human right so there was a human driver who was driving the car but the car does not have any you know uh, any knowledge about how to drive right it 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 only knows you know how to assist the driver in order to move from one place to the other now if we look from the neural network perspective what if the car also has you know what a human has so whenever we drive a car we know you know when to take left and when to take right when to stop and when not to stop when to you know accelerate and when to decelerate we all know about it because we are humans and we are you know we have understood this we have learned this over the years right over the years we have been better drivers you know uh, uh, like if you take my example i was a horrible driver probably 3 years back but now i am well enough to drive you know uh, a 1000 kilometers not a problem at one go but it has not eventually being the same every day or you know for the last 3 or 4 years so i have learned it over the years you know through my experiences uh, everyone learns through their own experiences now these self driving cars are nothing but you know where they are also artificially programmed in such a way that they can drive on their own without the help of any human intervention now the tesla cars which you right now see you know in in united states or or in some places in europe what you see generally is these are you know self driving cars right and these cars are fully automated vehicles and uh, you know every year these companies like nissan and toyota and mercedes and 
others as well like tesla as i said you know uh you, you will see they have these own concept cars um they have some of the cars which they already rolled out in the market right and they are you know successfully trying to be in the space of self driving car right now one of the most important application of computer vision right is the face recognition so neural network is once is also used in self driving cars is also used in facial recognition right so facial recognition as in now if nowadays if you take a picture and just store uh, in your you know google account or uh, if you upload it on i cloud or you know upload in on facebook and you when you want to tag it to your friend or you if you want to tag your friends in that picture you can automatically see that you know they are uh, recognized you know up front so you don't have to really type in but it gives you the suggestion that this particular individual is you know your friend or a family or whatever you know his name his or her name is so it means that these neural networks is the core of facial recognition as well so if you remember we used to do the tagging earlier right we used to say okay this is my my friend from left to right these are my friends but now facebook or these applications are doing it on their own so you can see that this artificially created neural network is helping us to you know uh, assist right it is helping us to complement our work and it is also making our lives easier right so this is the new technology of neural networks in you know some applications now what is a neural network and how does it work so if you go back to your school and if you have a chapter uh, of control and coordination you will probably uh, if you go through this chapter you will see that we have already talked about or learned about nervous system and as i said nervous system is nothing but you know which is created with a group of or, or billions of neurons right and these billions of neurons and uh, neurons actually you know coordinate among your brain and your central nervous system central nervous system is also part of it so it actually coordinates so these are there are thousands and thousands and millions and billions of these neurons which are actually working together to you know send signals to each other and based on that our human brain is able to take a collective decision right so this is what a neural network is so as i said we have learned about neural uh, central nervous system the central nervous system is made of brain and brains are made of neurons and these neurons are present in billions in our brain right so this is what a neuron is so we all understand from where this concept of neuron comes into picture right so ideally we are trying to mimic a human brain inside a artificial object and that's why we call it artificial neural network so whatever is inside our body is a neural network and whatever is inside a artificially made object right which is not created by human if we try to you know impart that into a object which is which is which is created by human right it's not natural we call it artificial neural network okay so you can see a picture of neuron in the book as well this is how a neuron looks like right it has cells inside it it has you know everything that is required you know to process a signal and these neurons are probably present in billions inside our body so these neurons interact with each other and basically decides how we react act to any situation and human memory is also due to this neurons right so now you understand that since we are trying to replicate a human a artificial neural network should also be able to react and act to any situation right and just like we have our own memory right so artificial neural networks neural networks have also their own memory and we'll come to it uh, what we are talking about and what is this uh, uh, memory feature in the neuron now moving on to 
some of the use cases you know now these are all the applications which are actually trained with past historical data right so here we say that you know this process of being training the model is what we have learned in the machine learning aspect as well but with the deep learning probably the number of data also increases and deep learning works best when you have enough data okay so if you have more and more data you know machine learning might not work uh, or can work up to a certain limit but deep learning will eventually be better with more data because as you can understand it has artificial neural networks and these new neural networks will interact with each other so the more the data they will be able to process it not a problem right so uh, as i said artificial neural networks will also show the same action reaction and memory just like we have for humans right and that is why we call it artificial intelligence just like we have our own intelligence right we can say uh, my iq is this and einstein's iq was that but what if that iq is being fed to a model which is artificially created and that instance is where we call it artificial intelligence right and neural network is a very small part of artificial intelligence okay now the central unit of human brain is neurons similarly the neural network has its central unit called artificial neurons so the neurons inside our body is part of the central nervous system and we call it neuron but the part or the neurons inside a uh, you know artificial body or object is called a artificial neuron and we call it nodes as well okay now human brains learn from its experiences and surroundings and ai learns from data so whatever data you feed to these uh, objects you will get similar type of response right so one classic example is wherein i can tell you uh, there was one company which launched its own you know bot uh, over to twitter so what it does is it it learns from whatever tweet it came um, for that particular company and it was able to you know respond to those tweets based on the queries but these bots were actually you know trained to you know take in real world tweets right say for example if i have a, a bot in twitter which basically responds for any you know a query for a company say for example uh, xyz right and xyz company is a product based company which basically sells say for example yes that was created by microsoft so uh, that's why i mentioned xyz but uh, yes it was created by microsoft and the problem happened is it it was trained through the incoming tweets on a real time right so people got to know about it and what they did is you know they started tweeting you know uh, absurd things and probably something which is uh, not according to social decorum and the tweet was also responding you know based on whatever was feeded to the particular bot and for that what happened is you know uh, the customer support experience got hampered and it was you know tweeting things which it should not right so that is why i'm saying that ai learns from data but we should be very vigilant what type of data we want to feed in okay right so artificial neural network is basically of you know it takes in two types of data one is the training data and the testing data just we have seen in machine learning algorithms but an artificial neural network has three layers one is the input layer the second is the hidden layer and the third is the output layer and we'll talk about each of these layers later uh, labels or layers in the next slide okay so for now 
try to understand that input layer is something which is feeded into these neural network and then we per basically divide these input layers into you know different parts and it goes through different hidden layers and here is where you know optimizers and um, activation functions will come into picture and then once the decision is being taken all the you know nodes are combined together we have our output layer right now if we see this picture we have two input layer or input nodes which we call x1 and x2 right and these input or input vectors have certain weights associated to it right and these weights are getting linearly transformed we'll understand what is linearly transformed uh, but for now try to understand linear transformation is nothing but say for example a simple linear regression right uh, where you sum up all your weights and after the linear transformation it goes into the activation function which is present in the hidden layer so this hidden layer basically has its own activation function and we'll come to activation function after this slide after the end of this slide and this activation function does nothing but some calculations and based on that calculation we get a certain output we call it prediction okay so you can see the linear transformation is happening here where we say w1 x1 plus w2 x2 likewise we have done linear regression where we had y equals to mx plus c right so these artificial neural networks is uh, you know different from machine learning algorithms why so because if you see a machine learning algorithm it's always a one way traffic where you feed in your data from uh, you know training data set and it gives you prediction and then you test on that prediction but here what happens is once you get a prediction in the output layer you can actually send it back to the you know hidden layers back to the input layer right so we feed the prediction back to the input layer and we'll go through the same process as above and we compare this prediction to actual results so this process is again you know done but in the opposite way where the data from the output layer moves into the input layer we call it back propagation we'll come back to that later but there might be some difference between what is the actual result and what is is predicted we all have seen machine learning algorithms as well so these are nothing but loss functions okay or basically what we call loss i'm sorry not function basically it is called loss that is the difference between the actual and the predicted value okay and we have seen this loss in linear regression so you know when i uh, was going through the class i made sure that this linear regression will also come into picture when we'll talk about artificial neural network now a, a model's task should be to lower the loss as much as possible so we want our prediction value and the actual values to be you know very similar so we would want our predicted value and the actual value to be very similar and there is where we call it a perfect neural network right this loss is being reduced by back propagation whatever i told you in the previous slide that you know in from input layer it goes to the output layer and from the output layer it again goes to the input layer so that is what we call it back propagation okay so this loss is been reduced by back propagation method where we manipulate the weights to reduce the difference between actual and the predicted value so if you understand all of these you know these nodes are connected through you know this line and these lines are basically having certain weights associated with it so if we change the weights you know accordingly we might come to a equation where the output and the input both are you know very similar and the loss is very less so the way we you know balance these weights this actually helps us in predicting the actual values right 
and the process by which it happens is called the back propagation and we repeat this process again and again until we get a perfect artificial neural network now moving on to the first type of neural network which we have that is our convolutional neural network now if you see this image i'm really sorry about this horrible image uh but if you can identify which type of image they are uh the the similar way a machine can also identify so why do you identify this picture if you just go back and you know try to understand why do we why are we able to understand whether it's a uh, it's a lizard or a alligator or something from the lizard family right uh so we understand this or we you know are able to figure out this because we have been trained through thousands of images right earlier and that is actually simulating in our brain because we have certain memory in our neurons and we are able to you know understand that this is actually a lizard or probably a um alligator right or a crocodile or whatever it is so we are able to understand this why because we have our own memory and we have been trained through a past data now all of a sudden if i show you an animal which you have never seen in your life right which you have never seen in your life and all of a sudden you know a uh, animal comes into picture and um probably no nobody knows about it right so in that instance we will not be able to you know predict or we will not be able to say what actually this animal is because we have not seen these type of data earlier but if if today i tell you that this particular animal or whatever new animal species which we have found is say alpha beta gamma that is name of the animal next time if i show you that particular animal's picture you'll be able to figure out okay this is particularly alpha beta gamma so this is how our brain works and this is how artificial neural network will also work right so if you look into a convolutional neural network it basically looks into the images and uh, it is part of a neural network architecture where we will look into the images and scan through it we'll do some pooling and all and through that we'll be able to figure out whether it's a uh, animal or a dog or a human or we will be able to classify it right so this is convolutional neural network again when we see an object we can find out what it is just like we can figure out it is a cat right even though this is a very you know rough sketch of a cat we are able to figure out that this is a cat right now our visual cortex is so strong that even though it is not so clear about an object it can figure out the object so this is called our visual cortex okay this is called our visual cortex but we can now train our machines to you know actually uh figure out just like we you know look into any image and are we, we are able to figure out like this is an animal or this is a cat or a dog and uh, Uh, a researcher yan lekun was first able to showcase that the same type of visual cortex can be built in machines as well right so using cnn nowadays we are able to do a lot of things right as i showed you show you told you image recognition is something which is very popular nowadays you know we a lot of these uh, uh countries or organizations are using these uh convolutional neural networks to establish a system right if i i recently went to the gurgaon office of my organization and they have built a very uh you know beautiful state of the art building and uh, when when i entered the office there was one camera and there was one tv the camera was able to was showing me or the tv was showing me my temperature and if i don't have a mask i have not put on my mask it will just you know uh tell me 
that please put on your mask you are ent entering into a densely uh, crowded area right because it's office right we are all together there so this is how convolutional neural network is also working and then uh, this helps us to do image processing image classification image clustering right uh, this will eventually grow as and when you know uh, more scientific research goes on and we are into a very good stage of you know using cnn into productions into um, different products uh, into different features of products clients now want you know this, these these neural networks to be part of our uh, of their existing products so this is a huge win and then if we look into cnn it has actually two parts right cnn is convolutional and the other is pooling right and it all goes through you know many activation layers right uh, it goes through many activation layers and after that it you know assimilates all the results and from there we get our final output but the question is what is convolution right convolution is nothing but scanning right so machine actually identifies any picture in the terms of pixel right we don't actually look into pixels or rather maybe you know our brains might look into pixels and then it is able to figure out but as a whole we don't uh, look into pixels if we from think from our perspective we rather look into you know at the edges and the shape of that particular um, object right and uh, so what machine looks into machine looks into the pixels and it scans the pixels through filters and gets the information about it so there are many filters through which these scanning goes on right and we are able to understand or the machine is able to understand what type of information they have for each of these pixels right so machine identifies any picture in terms of pixels it then scans the pixels through filters and gets the information about it right so it is nothing but it scans the pictures through filters and get the information about it so if you see this is a dog and what the machine does is it scans through all its pixel and then it you know finds the edges of that particular object or that particular you know dog and it also looks into the color to identify what type of breed it is it also looks into you know the different layers of you know edges and shapes of that particular dog to understand what breed of dog it is whether it's a dog or not right and these filters can be of many types right one is the curve filter which you can see the first one the next is the color filter which basically looks into the color and the third is the edge filter which basically looks into the edges of of uh, the entire body of the particular object now edge curve and color it will give us the whole picture of the image right what type of image it is now these filters can be different sizes for example uh, we can see a 5 cross 5 cross 5 filter right so it is nothing but you know the filters which we have created using the curve the color and the edges and these are you know different type of filters which work together inside a uh, activation function right and these filters have random filters and when we slide our convolve uh, uh, sorry convolve these filters over the dog's image then the random values of the filters creates a dot product with the image pixels to give us a new set of values which helps us to identify the property of the image so it is nothing but where we create a dot product of all these pictures and from that dot product that uh, particular machine is able to figure out what type of object it is basically it compares with the existing training data it has in the background to understand you know what are the different scenarios we have for each of these uh, pixels and for each of these pixels we'll be able to understand what type of object is how to classify it whether it's a cat or a dog or um, a lion or a tiger right because it has been fed with thousands and thousands of training data in the background right so all these dot products actually works in hand with the training it has gone through 
over the years or over the or a period of time now this is how the other properties of images are fed to the convolutional layer so you can see the dog so we are feeding in all the properties for example the curve the color the eyes and and there are many features which goes in through the input layer and then it moves on to the activation function or which we call the hidden layer and this hidden layer is you know uh, has has probably thousands and millions of um, uh, neurons inside it and it processes the data uh, through the pooling method which we just saw where it does, does the multiplication and the you know dot product to find out uh, individual filters now this can be done through many type of functions here it is mentioned sigmoid function we'll go through all the different types of functions which we have but for example if you see you know this particular model uh, basically predicts that it is 10% pomeranian it is 10% pug or it is 75% german shepherd so it is also able to you know find some probability associated to each of the breeds now if you if you think in 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 a way the machine already knows the properties of a pomeranian or a pug or a german shepherd or any breed of the dog right so that's why it is able to you know predict what type of uh, what type of image we had right what is the classification what would be the classification what will be the probability of each of these breeds now coming to the activation functions as we said there are many activation functions we will go through the activation functions uh, in, in some time so the first and foremost is the sigmoid function next is the tan h function third is the relu function leaky relu function max out and elu okay and we'll see you know why we chose you know tan h when we had sigmoid what are the limitation of tan h and relu and leaky relu and we'll go through all of this now we use normalization and regularization techniques to get the desired results like the relu which is the rectified linear unit we'll come to this in the next section but these are the activation functions which you should remember so if an interviewer ask you what can you tell me some activation functions you should be able to tell you know at least three at least three of them right and you should also understand how this looks and i will not go into much of the mathematical details uh, as of now uh, into each of these activation functions but you should ideally understand what are these activation functions and what are the challenges and limitations and what are the pros and cons now coming to the next one so we have already talked about cnn which is convolutional neural network we'll talk about the recurrent neural network now now if you have seen these devices which work Uh, you know with uh, with voice command like cd or alexa if you're using a smart tv probably you can use the voice command button to you know just play a song or you know watch a movie now how do they understand the our instructions right or how google understands what we are going to type as the next word the answer is a recurrent neural network right just like we have seen cnn powers the machine to identify images likewise we see that how rnn helps machine to understand and listen our language right and I, this is pretty much robust right now i can say it works perfectly you know 75 to 80% accurate with with absolute accuracy okay and uh, it is able to you know handle any type of language right now so you can use your own native language your uh, regional language uh, english is working perfectly fine so there is a lot there are a lot of researches which are going around in in recurrent neural network now just like other neural networks rnn also tries to minimize the difference between output and targets but the usp uh, of rnn is that it can memorize the previously given inputs or information and uses it to improve the prediction right so the most important thing with rnn is that it can memorize the previously given inputs now how does it helps it helps because 
you know human brain actually works with a, a lot of memory power so we say that you know this particular individual is very smart we can say you know he has very good memory he's a very good listener right why so because we are able to process the information inside our brain for a longer duration of time and likewise re recurrent neural network can also memorize the previously given inputs or information right you don't have to understand the equation and all only you just need to understand that there is something which is also connected you know backwise backward right this is what we call it memorize the previously given inputs right so ht actually remembers what happened in ht minus 1 right now the new recurrent neural network has another usp that it also understands the information or you know uh, or or it is able to process the information that is dependent on time and can be easily predicted through rnn so for example the playlist right i usually use um, or or i usually listen to songs through jio saavn or gana.com or you might have wink music or, or spotify right now what does this all do so it actually remembers on what you know day what type of movies do you or, or what type of songs do you like to listen right say for example uh, i like to listen to you know, motivational songs on monday probably if i hit the gym in the morning right and then on tuesday i want to hear some romantic songs or uh, on wednesday some classical songs or thursday you can hear to you know any other songs as you want so this is the pattern which my spotify learns or understands for for me as a user and now it will also recommend me you know these songs every day so uh, imagine that if i go to the gym on monday and if i hear, if i see you know classical songs as part of my playlist i would probably you know um, not like that user experience right rather if it's a monday or if it's the morning time every day if you recommend me you know uh, motivational songs or you know uh, gym songs probably it will help me to you know or it the the app will assist or help me take the correct or choose the right songs right so this is how recurrent neural network will also work now re recurrent neural network has many other uh application if you see you know gmail if you type in some words it will ask you to know uh, auto complete or it will give you certain words after uh, after after you type in say probably three or four words right so this is how it assists us based on our past writing behavior or by based on our past you know user behavior right so re recurrent neural network uh, as an example if i'm still in the spotify example wherein you can see as you feed in data for say monday to the network it can predict that the probability of the next playlist being romantic is the maximum right so it might happen that you know this is not only monday and tuesday it can be time to time basis say for example my general schedule is if i go to the morning i i generally hit the morning at 5:30 in the morning okay and then i come back to home and take a shower and when it's when i'm showering you know um i listen to some romantic songs or i listen to some english songs um my my favorite um uh, uh singers right or or music directors whatever i can say and then when i am going to the office uh in the car i probably hear something uh, much different right than what i hear in the gym and the shower so you can understand that the 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 time is again a factor wherein we can feed in more data 
to a user's customer experience and this will eventually guide us to create better products for particular individuals right now this type of experience once you have this type of experience where the app is you know giving me better recommendation uh, i might not shift from this app to the other app because i have that you know user experience if you compare um, um, for example uh, a streaming application right netflix has a very good uh, user experience right it will recommend you probably the right movies it will recommend you the top movies in your particular country it will recommend you the you know, worldwide top uh, you know uh, movies so this is how the user experience is obviously netflix is much better to handle it's very fast efficient as opposed to you know if you uh, open mx player or if you open uh, say for example um, uh sony live for example the user experience is not so good there so that's why people prefer to watch movies in you know netflix and prime um uh, and um uh, uh, hotstar for example so because they have this very good user experience and that is what is done through artificial neural networks so if you see netflix it all works on recommendation engine so our home pages are customized based on our past history uh based on you know our age and you know the the individuals in our age groups what type of contents they are watching right so this is how we create better user experience using a recurrent neural network okay okay so the reason this network is called recurrent is because recurrent means repeating itself again and again right and rnn is dependent on activation functions like tanh so in the previous example we have seen something called the sigmoid function here we are talking about tanh function but not only tanh there are now many other uh, functions activation functions which 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 work for you know uh, recurrent neural networks okay don't remember any of these uh, formulas okay or equations now what is the difference between an rnn and a cnn right uh, cnn scans images and find patterns in shape size and color whereas rnn finds time bound patterns uh, hope you all understood now what is the difference between a cnn and a rnn we gave very specific examples to cnn and rnn right rnn finds time bound patterns right if you don't remember this try to remember a song playlist for example which is part of the rnn and a image classification which is part of a cnn now cnn tries to recognize faces by looking into the patterns of lines and curves whereas rnn predicts the next word based on the previous words because as i said rnn has a a very good you know feature or usp where it remembers what has happened in the previous level right so for example if you type in over whatsapp a lot can happen over then a blank probably someone will see conversation is word someone can see day someone can see coffee or a phone or meetings right you can try it on your own now on whatsapp and you will probably see what uh it ideally gives you as an option right so there might be you know different answers you, know, you can say a lot can happen over coffee so this is very famous but uh, you can say a lot can happen over meetings as well right uh, ideally my experience with meetings are very boring but still a lot can happen over meetings all right so as i said rnn and cnn difference in simple terms rnn empowers the machine to visualize images then rnn empowers machine to understand text right now rnn has now evolved right as i said after a lot of research and experimentations rnn now has evolved to lstm networks which we call it long short term memory network okay here lstm actually helps us to overcome the vanishing gradient problem with rnn we will understand what is the vanishing gradient problem later but i will just try to give you an example where i already told you you know 
these neural networks actually pass on messages from you know or inputs from the input layer to the hidden layer to the output layer right and then to verify that it it again goes to the back propagation model where we see uh, it moves from the output layer to the hidden layer to the input layer now within that process you know at times what happens is with rnn that a lot of information you know vanishes a lot of information vanishes so if you have seen this uh, um or if you have played this game called chinese whisper has has anyone played this game called chinese whisper can you say yes or no for those who don't understand chinese right so this is a chinese whisper game where you know you speak something to you know your immediate partner or the person who is standing next to you and he again you know conveys that same to the other person and it goes on and goes on and goes on and at the end you will try to find out you know what the first person has said and what the last person that q says right this is called a chinese whisper game right now you understood what is a chinese whisper game so what happens is we pass on information from one individual to the other uh individual and say for example i say a lot can happen over coffee and you pass on that message to the other one saying a lot can ha happen over toffee right and that particular individual again passes the same information saying a lot can happen over say uh, 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 a meeting right so you see the information is getting you know vanished by the time it enters or or moves to the last person so the last person might say something very different maybe a uh, uh, a lot a lot has happened right which is all together different now this is the same problem with recurrent neural network so whenever you have a long chain of chain of neurons if you you know understand each of these human beings as you know neurons they are actually passing on the signal from one place to other right so you say that these informations are getting vanished right and this is called the vanishing gradient problem your information might get van vanished right so this is the problem with rnn but we overcome this problem using lstm okay we'll see what is lstm in the subsequent section all right all right we'll move on to the next section now where we will talk about the activation functions as i said i won't be going much into the details of this activation functions because um, they are itself you know um, a topic of discussion for uh, probably one hour for each of them right so what are artificial neural network we have all seen through it but we'll go a little detailed into it right so artificial neural networks are nothing but very powerful strong and complicated you know machine learning techniques which mimics a human brain and how it functions so as i said human brains brains has millions of neurons in a hierarchy and networks of neurons which are interconnected with each other via axons okay just give me a second yes so now that neurons actually are interconnected with each other via axons and it you know passes these electrical signals from one layer to the other and which which we call it synapses so uh, if you see uh, the the diagram which i have already shared in the previous slide these axons and synapses are all part of it and this is how we humans learn so we actually learns from learn from these different different signals and whenever we see hear feel and think about something uh, a synapse or electrical impulse is fired from one neuron to the other in the hierarchy which enables us to learn 
remember and memorize things in our daily life since the day we were born right so this is the entire architecture on a very high level of a artificial neural network right now as i said this is a artificial neural network which which has the input layer and which has the hidden layer and which has the output layer now what are these activation functions and what are it uses in the neural network model right artificial function uh, activation functions are also known as transfer functions right why transfer functions you will obviously understand that it transfers one signal from the other from one node or one neuron to the other node or the other neuron right and it can also be attached in between two uh neural networks so these are nothing but where they are attached with you know different neural networks this each of these neural networks are attached to each other now this is why it is called also a transfer function because it actually transfers you know electrical impulses or signals from one neuron to the other activation functions are important for an artificial neural network to learn and understand the complex patterns so these activation functions are nothing but which helps the neuron to you know learn individual signals and then there are complex patterns which are you know broken down into different parts and each of these neurons actually are part of you know a, a larger set of the nervous system now the main function of it is to introduce non linear properties into the network when we say non linear properties we'll look into the non linear and the linear you know uh, activation functions and there you will understand that it basically introduces some non linearity in the data set what it does it is is it calculates the weighted sum and adds direction and decides whether to fire a particular neuron or not so there are ma many neurons right in the entire you know uh, neural network but as i said there there is there is the input node which is x1 and x2 and you have the weight associated to each of these uh activation functions right and these weighted sums are then added and it adds certain direction to your impulses or electrical signals to which you know neuron it will pass through and which it will not pass through so the one which is which it 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 actually passes through is called where 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 we call it which neuron to fire right or activate and which neuron not to activate or where which we call it a dead neuron we will come to that in the later part of time now this may their main purpose is to convert a input signal of a node into a artificial neural network to an output signal right so input layer goes on to the neural networks or hidden layers or the activation functions and then output signal comes out and that output signal now is used to as an input in the next layer in the stack so this is how it moves on from one layer to the other layer right as i said there are many hidden layers inside this hidden layer okay and we'll come to that again uh, and and it basically does what it does is it passes these signals from one nodes or one neuron to the other now the non linear activation function will help the neuron model to understand the complexity and give accurate result just like we have you know seen non linear uh, equations in machine learning like decision trees and random forest uh, it here also we have non 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 linear activation functions which basically helps the model to understand the complexity right now the next question that will arise is why can't we do it without activating the input signal right what if i want to you know activate all the input signals and we don't need a activation function to you know specifically pass on these signals now if we do not apply a activation function then the output signal would simply be a simple linear function and that's why i said linear regression which is you know a linear transformation of the input variables it is much different from the neural network because it introduces certain non linearity in the data set right a linear function is just a polynomial of one degree right why we have seen y equals to mx plus c there is no other degree only one degree which is a polynomial function again 
now a linear equation is easy to solve but they are limited in their complexity and have less power to learn complex functional mappings from data right so it is very easy y equals to mx plus c we have been doing this for a long time now probably in maths we started this way back in class 8 right and we are doing it and this is easy that's why we have learned this at you know at such a such a age where we were like probably 13 14 right but now linear function are very easy but they are not you know much inclined towards solving complex problems right so if we want to solve complex problems which are non non linear functions in that case um, linear regression is not the ideal solution a neural network without activation function would simply be a linear regression model which has limited power and does not perform good most of the times now you all understand that y equals to mx plus c is just a linear regression model it does not have any non linearity so and a neural network which is which does not have a, a non linear equation is simply a linear regression model also without activation function or our neural network would not be able to learn and model other complicated kinds of you know data such as images videos audios and speech so it, this might be useful to solve you know time series data where there is no non linearity in the data but it will not work if you want to process unstructured data uh, mainly images videos audios and speech okay now there are two types of function by now you all have understood that there is something called linear activation function and something called the non linear activation functions so let's understand both of them in the next slide now what is a linear function what is a linear or identity activation function as you can see the function is a line or linear so if you just look into this quadrant right this is this is what you can understand is a a, a linear equation linear equation or linear regression right where y equals to mx plus mx plus c is there right there is no intercept so c becomes zero and our tan 45 this is 45 degree angle so tan 45 is again 1 so y equals to mx plus c becomes m is 1 and c is 0 so y equals to x right so this is what the equation looks like for y equals to x and if i just replace this with a function so fx is equals to x right and if you draw this you know on the other quadrant you will see that it also tends to move towards minus x right uh, or rather we can say infinity because it will go on and go on as you increase the range right so the range is going to be minus infinity to infinity so this is a linear identity activation function okay linear or identity activation function so at times interviewer might want to trick you with you know asking very simple basic level of deep learning questions so if you say i you know probably know i am i have a little knowledge on deep learning but now i am not an expert then probably they will ask you questions like this where can you tell me what is the identity activation function what with the equation what with the range why it is not useful and all, all right so this slide is for that it does not help with the complexity or various parameters of un of usual data that is fed to neural networks so this is a very plain and simple linear or identity activation function now the next is where we have the stepped function okay a stepped function is one of the simplest kind of activation functions in this we consider a threshold value and the value of the net input says say y is greater than the threshold then the neuron is activated right say for example uh if i have a classification model i'm just giving an analogy example okay don't take it you know seriously so for example if i have uh, millions of you know, news articles which are coming from a particular server 
or from different sources and i'm trying to you know classify this using a deep learning model and if i use a step function what would ideally it will say is if it goes through you know uh, uh certain weight it goes through certain weights and it has some parameters associated and it calculates some value right and the, if the value comes say more than 0 0.07 you take it as as one or if it is less than 70 or 0.7 you take it as zero so step function works here right whenever we have a 0.7 it will activate the next neuron whenever we have a less than 0.7 it will not activate the next neuron right so a step function is one of the simplest kind of activation functions in which we consider a threshold value and if the value of the net input is greater than the threshold then the neuron is activated so it is very easy fx is equals to 1 if x is greater than equals to 0 so now if you compare this with the linear activation function what we have done is uh, we have limited the range right because uh, minus infinity to infinity is something which does not make any sense for a real life scenario right so that's why the step function was introduced where we were limiting the value from 0 to 1 right and you can say that it is ideally something very close to a uh, you know logistic regression function where you have a 0 and a 1 or a classification scenario where you have a 0 and a 1 let's understand this again with the next example now why do we need a non linear equation so the previous one which you saw so this is just for the example the interviewer might ask you can you give me an example of a linear activation function then you can say that yes we have identity activation function and we have a step active step uh, activation function okay now why do we need the non linearities in the data non linearity non linear functions are those which have a degree more than 1 and they have a curvature when we plot a non linear function we all know that you know anything apart from a 1 degree function will actually be a curve so we have understood this in our random forest example or a distant tree example as well now we need a neural network model to learn and represent almost anything and any arbitrary complex function which maps inputs to outputs right so whenever we have a curve in the data when whenever we have a non linearity in the data we have to use a non linear activation function so we use a non linear activation we are able to generate non-linear mappings from inputs to outputs so for example if i have a non-linear function but i try to find or figure this out uh, or map the points over a non-linear function it will not work right so you have to have a non-linear function for a linear model uh, non-linear model a non-linear function okay now it is easy to for the model to generalize or adapt with variety of data and to differentiate between the output but because ideally if you see uh, barring few uh, scenarios majority of our data which we see nowadays in our you know real life are actually non linear right and for that non linear activation function is very much required to for for our you know analysis for our uh, neurons to understand and make decisions right All right. So, what is derivative or differential with nonlinear data? So, just to make sure that those who don't remember this from you know their basic classes, uh, change in y with respect to change in x, it is also known as slope. So, it is which is called a derivative, dy by dx. Right. These activation functions are you know differentiable. That means that we can find the slope of the sigmoid curve at any two points. Okay. So if you see, if you want, since this is not, not linear, so we do, we have to actually look into the slope as well, right? So at each point, we will actually calculate the slope in order to make sure that our activation fun functions are working in a proper way. Okay. And the th second one is third one is the monotonic function where a function, which is either entirely non-increasing or a non decreasing function okay that is called a monotonic function we'll come to that again 
now the non linear activation functions are mainly divided on the basis of their range or curves so let's look into the first one which is the sigmoid or the logistic activation function we generally call it the sigmoid activation function now a sigmoid function looks like a s curve okay it looks like a s curve if you remember lin logistic regression function you will also remember this equation right the main reason why we use a sigmoid function is because it because it exists between 0 to 1 right therefore it is specially used for models where we have to predict the probability as an output now since the probability of anything exists only between the range of 0 to 1 sigmoid is the right choice and a logistic sigmoid function can use a neural network to get stuck at the training time uh so so let's understand this sigmoid activation function first so it is again very easy it looks like a s shape it has values ranging from 0 to 1 so anything which is related to probability can be predicted using a sigmoid activation functions and that's why when i was talking about image classification and where you saw you know the image of a german shepherd and it was saying that 10% chances it is a pomeranian and 10% chances it is a pug and you know 75% chances that it is a german shepherd and so on right so there a probability value was associated and there that's why we used a sigmoid function there right now the beauty of an exponent is that the value never reaches 0 nor reaches 1 in the above equation so ideally when we whenever we create a solution we'll see you know uh, very le less chances are there that the values will be 0% it will probably give some percentage probably 1% or 2% or 5% or 10% right because the images which we see are all these images if, if you compare a human to a dog probably you will see some features might you know look same for a human and a dog so probably the eyes right it might be you know 2% similar or 5% similar so you can say that whenever we use a sigmoid function to classify or any probability prob probabilistic model you always have values which have certain percentage of confidence right it will neither be 0% or it will never be a 1% or 100% so a large negative numbers are scaled towards 0 and a large positive numbers are scaled towards 1 so now you can understand that majority of these values will not touch 0 but it will be towards 0 and large positive values will not be 1 but will be towards 1 right so this is a sigmoid logistic or logistic activation function hope you all understood now what is the disadvantage of a sigmoid function right the major reason which we have made it fall out of popularity so now why we are not using sigmoid function right now these days because it has vanishing gradient problem as i said you know the chinese whisper example where you pass on information from one place to the other right you pass on information from one place to the other and the information gets lost we call it in vanishing gradient problem so the gradient actually vanishes over time okay so that becomes a problem so we'll uh, we'll come to that right what are the different challenges with it but for now try to understand that we have this vanishing gradient problem secondly its output isn't zero centered right as i said it the probability values will be somewhere around 1% or 5% or 10% but it will never be zero so it is isn't zero centered it makes the gradient updates go too far in directions uh, in different directions so you can see that you know since the values are not centered towards zero or one uh you know these whatever gradients or whatever updates we are making to each of these neurons based on you know what predictions we are getting as output we have to make a lot of changes okay and it makes the optimization harder say for example if it is 0% what it does in it it is basically you know removes a lot of complex uh you know neurons or or the neurons which are not required for the analysis can make it dead neurons right 
but it is not happening. So you can see a lot of complex um, uh, equations which comes into picture and it becomes very hard to do optimization. We'll come to optimization in the next section. Next is sigmoids saturate and kill gradients. Okay. Now, all of a sudden you understand that, you know, since a lot of these points are near about 4% or 3%, these neurons are actually not playing any part in the analysis, right? And eventually are getting killed, right? So, sorry, not the neurons, but the gradients. The gradients which carry, you know, 2% or 3% or 4%, they do, do not carry any significant meaning. And that's why these gradients are, are killed because of vanishing gradient problems. And sigmoids have very low, slow convergence. We'll come to convergence when we talk about the optimization part. But try to understand that convergence is something which is related to, again, the gradient descent, where we find out the best, you know, learning rate, we find out the global minima, not the local minima. And this will eventually be a, uh, and this is eventually a disadvantage of a sigmoid function. So very important slide if you wish to, you know, um, uh, if, if the interview asks you anything related to sigmoid function. Now, next comes the tanh function. We have understood or, or we have seen an example of tanh function in the previous uh, slide, but Tanish function is nothing but with a ma mathematical formula of one minus exponent of minus two X by one plus exponent of minus two X. Don't remember it, just ignore it. But understand that its output is zero centered because it has range between minus one to one, right? That is, it is not from one to zero, but rather it is from one to minus one. You can see the minus one over here and one over here so you see a zero here right what it means that a lot of your values will be actually zero centered right a lot of your value will be actually zero centers so the hence the optimization is easier in this method hence it practice in practice it is always preferred over a sigmoid function but still there is a vanishing gradient problem because now you understand that it does not do, do anything with memorizing the data, right? Or it does not have a link to what it has, you know, uh, learned in the previous uh, previous node, right? So it still has a vanishing gradient problem. So you understand that the major problem with with the sigma function was that it is not zero centered, but now it is zero centered with tan h. Now the problem only is with the vanishing gradient problem, right? Now to help with this, we have come through a new activation function, which we call it a ReLU activation function. Okay, rectified linear unit. Okay. It was recently proved that it has six times improvement in convergence from a tanh function. Okay, we have seen tanh in the previous slide. And this is how the leaky ReLU looks like. Okay. It, what it does it, it has a max out feature, right? So whenever a value, you no know, tends to be towards or less than zero. Okay. It assumes it at zero. Okay. So anything which is less than zero, say for example, if minus seven comes into picture, it will be assumed as zero. So you can see a lot of these points or a lot of these points, which are actually negative are made zero right and anything if it is greater than zero will be taken as x so it is not limited to one but rather it moves from zero to x or zero to infinity right so it hence uh, avoids and rectifies the vanishing gradient problem Okay, it rectifies the vanishing gradient problem because now all of your points will be converged towards zero. So any information, if it is lost, will be zero. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it. But its limitation is that it should only be used within hidden layers of the neural network model. And uh, another problem with leaky ReLU is that some gradients can be fragile during training and can die. It can cause a weight update 
which will make it never activate on any data point again simply saying that relu relu could result in dead neurons now the problem is say for example if you want to predict an image what happens is uh in the meanwhile since it is working from 0 to x a lot of you know a data can actually become zero because uh, it has very less value but since many of them in training becomes if it becomes zero and if it dies the problem is that you will won't get you know a pixel of that particular point say for example you are doing a image recognition if you don't get a picture of what's there on a face right probably you are only able to figure out what the body looks like but face neurons all have died the problem will be that due to these dead neurons uh, the the pixels of the face did not get activated and for that matter what happened is even though it was fast it is not able to give the correct result right and for that to solve that we have our leaky relu okay leaky relu is wherein instead of making the value zero right you are giving a very small slope to keep the updates right you can see it is not zero but rather it is very near to zero okay so there is a negative value so what happens is due to the negative value the neuron is still activated right it does not have a problem of dead neurons so leaky relu function is nothing but an improved version of the relu function okay instead of defining the relu function as 0 for x less than 0 we define it as a small linear component of x it can be defined as fx is equals to a of x whenever x is less than 0 or else it will be x so it introduces a small slope to keep the updates alive so we are able to solve the problem of the dead neurons understood so this is how a uh, relu activation function which is rectified linear unit can be transformed to a linear rectified linear unit okay so this was our activation functions any question so this why i am going through all of this because whenever you mention these as part of you know i am knowledge in deep learning they might ask you this type of questions okay and if you want to know more about it i will share tutorials with you where you can go through it okay sure i will go through relu okay so as i said relu activation function or relu linear unit is nothing but a monotonic function okay it's a monotonic function why monotonic because as you see it gives you an output zero or a x so it's a monotonic function so the function will return zero if it receives any negative input but for any positive value of x it returns that value back okay this is a plain and simple relu linear unit right so it the value will lie between 0 to infinity right now why relu activation function is you know was was one of the best right if uh, you just ignore the dead neuron problem for now because it was very fast it was very simple uh, it seems to work well with majority of the cases right and uh, if you read a lot of these research papers um, um not not too far away from uh, today probably 4 to 5 years back when i was you know uh, working extensively with deep learning uh 
you will see that a lot of these researchers were using you know deep neural networks with relu and it used to converge very fast in very very quickly and you know a very reliable manner and uh, as i said earlier sigmoid functions were used and then moved to tanh and then relu and relu was you know probably the one of the best at once one point of time where researchers were using it for any sort of analysis whether it's for cnn or through rnn okay and uh, if you particularly look into cnn cnn uh, relu actually helps to prevent the exponential growth in the computation required to operate a neural network so as you can see that most of the neural networks nowadays required a uh, requires a huge gpu right and uh, uh, relu actually solved that problem by uh, you know rectifying the vanishing gradient problem uh, it since it is you know very fast reliable and uses very less computation power it was uh, it was very much helpful to perform you know image classification and cnn um, um, and the scaling of the features right so ideally the computational power was also very uh, computation time was less and the space was which was required in the gpu was also very less okay and the next thing which i am taught ta wanted to talk is vanishing gradient problem where uh, majority of these activation functions prior to relu were having this vanishing gradient problem but uh, relu is relu has a limitation where it is only used in a you know hidden layer of the neural network making it you know uh, only part of the uh, hidden layer architecture so at times we also require this type of um, activation functions in other units as well apart from the hidden layers okay the problem with relu as i said relu has problem with dead neurons right um, and uh, relu cannot be used in the output layer for a classification problem right so why so because relu activation function simply sets uh, everything that is negative to zero so if you are classifying hence you know the likelihood of relu uh, using relu does not make any sense because it might make many of your values zero so you cannot use it in the output layer you can only use it in the hidden layer leaky relu uh i am sure that uh, it is again used in the output layer as well uh it is actually used in the output layer as well because it has some negative value associated with it so it does not makes any of the values zero um but uh let me think through it so leaky relu has a negative value so ideally it does not have a problem no you can use it in the uh, output layer not a problem okay so the problem with relu is that it has you know a dying neuron problem or we call it dying relu problem and it does since it does not have you know um, zero slope parts because you know you are making it max of zero uh, in in the negative side so that's why you were not able to use it in the uh, output layer but you can now use it in the uh, leaky relu can be used in the output layer all right so 
we'll move on to the next part let me just check why dying neuron happens okay dying neurons will happen because if eventually if your weight vector so for example if i just give you one example of x1 w1 plus x2 w2 right activation function is nothing but where you use these uh, uh, these examples to you know actually change the weights so for example if your weight w1 becomes zero right and w1 x1 is actually your one neuron the linear transformation of one neuron so if w1 becomes zero obviously w0 uh, into x1 will also become zero so that's why your neuron will become dead right because the weight associated is very less but with leaky value we can see we are making it ax which is negative so even if you have a negative value your neuron will not be dead in what scenario weight will become zero yeah this is the scenario right wherein if you have a relu activation function and whenever you see that you know any value tends to be negative and you are making it zero through this activation function it will become zero and your weight will be also change to zero making the neuron dead okay but with leaky relu whenever you have uh for example let me give you an example say if you have pixel values and you know the picture pixels are not very clear and it gives you after the cross uh, product if you get you know negative values of 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 the eigens or whatever it is in the background right if you have the negative value it will make it zero so instead of making it zero if we can give a very negative value to it very little negative value at least the neuron will not be dead right so even if it is not able to predict one part of the feature right uh, it might give you a rough sketch of that particular image say for example if the ears are not visible or the pixels of the ears are not you know clearly mentioned or it it's not much clear instead of just avoiding that ear so if you see a face with one ear just chopped off and if you see a image with one ear perfectly fine and the other ear a little you know shaky or a little dull right in the picture it it is not a problem right at least you are able to figure out what it is and this comes to the same question image which we have seen that even though we don't know much about a particular picture you know just the rough rough sketch right even if it is not so strong right the the object is not that clear right in the previous picture we are able to recognize that it is actually a cat right so dead neuron will actually make something like this which is not much clear but uh a uh, a leaky sorry a leaky relu will probably make something which is not that clear but a dead neuron will probably you know you won't see any face at all right so this is one example very simple basic example but this is what the difference is when you have a neuron which is dead and the neuron which has very less value even though it does not gives you know a 100% picture of the entire scenario but still it is enough for us to you know not make the 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 prediction value to be say probably probably 100% accurate all right so we'll start with the optimization before that i think there was a question uh, does lstm also use leaky relu to help the gradient vanishing gradient uh no lstm actually has this inbuilt capability of you know remembering what has happened in the previous state so activation function is not you know, much required for that so lstm is 
altogether evolved from the CNN RNN concept. But my usual take is that you know whenever we use the LSTM net uh, model, we generally prefer to use the tan H activation function. Okay, LSTM actually work very well with the tan H activation function, and uh, uh, in in the hidden layer and the sigmoid activation function in the output layer. So this is one thing which uh, LSTM does. And LSTM is not, you know, ideally designed for um, using ReLU activation for matter. And uh, since ReLU is not used, leaky ReLU is also not used in the LSTM. So LSTM, since it has its own capability of using the time factor into account, uh, you will either use the tanh function or the sigmoid function, but not the ReLU function because it is not appropriate for you know recurrent neural networks uh, such as LSTM to use um, a ReLU activation function or a leaky ReLU activation function. All right, so we'll move on to the various optimization algorithms for training neural network. Now that we know that what is the activation function this is nothing but a function which helps us to you know pass on the signal from one neuron to the other neuron now many of us might be using these optimizers while training the neural network without knowing that the method is known as optimization now optimizers are algorithms or methods used to change the attributes of your neural network such as your weights and learning rate in order to reduce the losses so whenever we saw the example where you know there is a difference between uh, the the actual and the predicted value right in that case we have a loss function associated right we have a loss function which is associated now this uh, loss function can be you know reduced by changing the weight vectors which we have say for example if i right so if you have an input layer of x1 and x2 and if you have a you know weight vector which starts from w1 to wn and then you have a linear transformation right like w1 x1 plus w2 x2 and whatever it is now since we are doing this linear transformation or non-linear transformation using this activation function. So the activation function will actually carry the signal from one place to the other. But how do we change the weight values, all right? The input variables or the weight values that is actually done through optimizers. So that's why it's saying that many people may be using optimizers while training the neural network without knowing that the method is known as optimization, right? Optimizers are algorithms or methods used to change the attributes of your neural network, such as weights and learning rate in order to reduce the losses. We all know what learning rate is, but if you don't remember, don't worry, we'll go through that again. So now in this picture, what you can see is it says I am oscillating. What do I do? Right? So since it is trying to find the best learning rate or the global minima, right it is oscillating from one place to the other so if you remember the gradient descent problem which we have already seen uh, you know in the machine learning algorithm classes it actually is a u-shaped curve right it's a u-shaped curve which basically tells you where is the global minima and this global minima is the point where you will get the minimum loss right it will be it will give you the minimum loss right now what generally happens is if you oscillate uh, a ball uh, in, a, in a u shaped or you know or a, in a curved shaped object it will first oscillate from one place to the other right in in the meantime it might uh, you know cross the global minima at times and then again roll up and then roll down uh, but eventually it will try to settle to a point where you have the minima right where you have the minima okay now how you should change your weights or learning rates of your le neural network to reduce the losses is defined by the optimizers you use 
and the optimization algorithms or strategies are responsible for reducing the losses and to provide the most accurate results possible right so these are nothing but these optimization algorithms are nothing but how you should change your weights and the learning rates right in the neural network and we'll look into all these you know strategies and optimization techniques one by one so let's come to the first one which is the most basic one and we have already gone through it previously now gradient descent gradient descent is the most basic but but most used optimization algorithm it's used heavily in linear regression and classification algorithms as i said we have all gone through it and the back propagation in neural network also uses a gradient descent algorithm so then the go now the good thing about neural network is that we can actually do the back propagation in order to compare our actual values and the predicted values and here we will be using the gradient descent algorithm for our analysis gradient descent is first order optimization algorithm which is dependent on the first order derivative of a loss function we already have seen the first order derivative which is the dy by dx um, if you don't understand this derivative don't worry about it it is actually where you create a where you take the first order differentiation of a loss function okay uh, in our linear regression our loss function was nothing but the difference between the actual and the predicted value it calculates that which way the weight should be altered so that the function can reach a minima right it tries to optimize the function in such a way that you get the minimum loss and through back propagation the loss is transferred from one layer to another and the model's parameter also known as weights are modified depending on the losses so that the loss can be minimized now if you remember uh the mathematical equations which you used to solve you know uh, in class 11 12 or 9 10 where we need to find the global minima or global maxima or which point will give us the maximum value and what will the maximum value of this particular equation we used to do the differentiation of first order or second order right it's the same here we do the first order differentiation of the loss function right in order to find out what would be the ideal weight where the loss function will be minimum okay and uh, de it de actually depends on the weight parameters of the individual equations so all equations are different and for that matter the loss function will also be different right or, or at least the parameters of the loss function will also be different and from there we can calculate the gradient descent now we don't want to go into the mathematical concept but rather if you see the just the example of a uh, uh, gradient descent algorithm it is nothing but where you are actually finding the derivative of your loss function so don't worry about it we'll we'll see what are the advantages of gradient descent gradient descent is again very e easy to compute because we are only doing the first order derivative of our loss function right it is very easy to implement that's why it works perfectly with linear regression as well and it is very easy to understand as well that you are actually oscillating from one place to another and it will settle down at a point where you have the local or uh, global minima and if you put the global minima value to your original equation it will give you the minimum loss right so this is the gradient descent now what's what's the learning rate behind it what's what's learning rate now learning rate is nothing but how fast you will move from one place to another say for example if you want to descend to from a mountain right so for example uh, if we go to trekking so ideally i go for trekking every year um, i have also plans this year as well so if you go for trekking what you will see is you ascend for 3 days but you generally descend in probably one day right so so what happens is the rate at which you descend is actually high right so since it is high you know you actually uh move down very faster from the from from mountains to the valley okay and with that we can compare with this with a high learning rate so if you have a high learning rate you will you know probably climb very fast 
and probably uh, move down very fast. So this is a high learning rate. If I increase the learning rate very high, you might, you know, jump from one place to another. Okay. And if you jump from one place to another, you might not reach the local minima and you might jump to the other place, right? So if this is your local minima, say, for example, this is your local minima, the white dot, you might hop from here to here and here to here instead of, you know, moving to this place uh, or, or rather visiting this place. So you, if your learning rate is very high, you might not reach the global minima. Again, if you, if your learning rate is very low, right, you might descend so slow, right? If you are descending very slow, it will take infinity to, you know, reach the global minima. Right? if you want to crawl down the uh, mountain or if you want to crawl up a mountain, right, you might not reach the global minima uh, ever. Right. So your uh, learning rate should be optimal. And there, there is where the uh, uh, optimizers help us to find the perfect weight and the perfect linear rate. Okay. All right. So the advantage is that it is easy computation, easy to implement and easy to understand. Next is the disadvantage may trap at local minima. Uh, so, so what happens is that since you are using a gradient descent algorithm and, you know, if the optimizer uh, optimizer is not able to, you know, find the right learning rate, you might tr get trapped at the local minima. You might not get the um, global minima. What is this local minima and global minima? Say, for example, if you have, if you want to reach to the top of a mountain, Okay, you have to, you know, cross a lot of mountain peaks or valleys in order to reach that mountain top. Okay, so for example, if you want to go to Mount Everest. So if your learning rate is very slow or, you know, um, uh, if, if the weights are not optimized correctly, the problem is that you might think that you are on top of the highest mountain, but actually not. You are trapped at a local mountain or a local minima rather than you know the global minima or rather if you want to go to the valley uh, or the local valley you might get trapped at a local valley which is you know not the actual valley but uh, a pass between two mountains right so this is how you the disadvantage of uh, gradient descent is that you might get trapped at the local minima Weights are changed after calculating gradient on the whole data set. So if the data set is too large, then this might take years to converge to the minima. So the same problem as we had with, you know, the testing and training data set, when we were splitting it into 80% and 20%, um, we were not doing any K fold classification, no cross validation, nothing. Right. So here is the same problem. The gradient descent actually takes the entire data into picture at once. Okay. And uh, since it tries to do this with a large data set, uh, converging to the minimum will take you know eternity. Next is it requires large memory to calculate gradient on the whole data set. Obviously, because we are using the entire data set at once, it might require a huge amount of time, a huge amount of you know, computational power to perform this analysis. Now to overcome this, we have come to something called the stochastic gradient descent. Now it's a variant of gradient descent where it tries to update the model's parameter more frequently. In this, the model parameters are altered after computation of loss on each training example. So if the data set contains thousand rows, you know, stochastic gradient descent will update the model parameters thousand times in one cycle of data set instead of one times in the gradient De descent right so as i said gradient descent takes all the entire data into picture right but stochastic gradient descent does not does that right it tries to update the model's parameters more frequently okay instead of doing it after reading through all the thousand rows it does it for each and every rows okay and based on that it computes the loss at each training example so that data set can 
if contains you know thousand rows, it will probably have thousand times of updation of the parameters. All right. So now you can understand there is one more problem with stochastic gradient descent, but we'll come through that. Don't worry. But the only difference is that at each you know step, it tries to optimize the parameters. Okay, instead of doing it all at once. As the model parameters are frequently updated, parameters have high variance and fluctuations in loss functions at different intensity. So the advantage we have for stochastic gradient descent is that it you know frequent updates of model parameters hence converges in less time. It requires less memory, so no need to store values of loss functions, and may get the new minima. Okay, the advantage is that it can, might get you know better minima, not the local minima, but better minima than the gradient descent. Now the disadvantage with uh, stochastic gradient descent is that high variance in the model parameters, right? Obviously, because it is doing this for a lot of time, so the variance might be uh, high. May shoot even after achieving global minima, right? Even though we have reached the global minima, it might you know go again. Uh, and try to find new global minima, right? And to get the same convergence as gradient descent needs to slowly reduce the value of the learning rate. Now the learning rate needs to be reduced a bit because you know, it is doing it for a lot of these parameters again and again and again and again, right? So the, to receive the same convergence, we need to reduce the value of the learning rate. Now, obviously, with stochastic gradient descent, the problem is it does it for every iteration. So we have to find out some more viable solution. And here comes the mini batch gradient descent. Now, mini mini batch gradient descent is best among all the variations of gradient descent algorithm. It's an improved on the stochastic gradient descent and standard gradient descent. It updates the model parameters after every batch. Right, so the data set is divided into various batches, and after you know every batch, the parameters are updated. Obviously, we can understand that you know doing it for thousand rows of data set is you know unnecessary. Rather, we divide it into say, for example, a batch of ten, where we have ten data, uh, hundred data at each in each of these batches, and for that we can do our mini batch gradient descent algorithm. Right. Now, what are the advantage? The advantage is that frequently updates the model parameters and also has less variance. It will have very less variance than stochastic gradient descent because it does it for you know ten batches, not thousand, right? And it requires medium amount of memory because again, you know, to handle you know hundred uh, data at once as opposed to one in stochastic gradient descent will take you know um, some amount of memory. Now, all types of gradient descent have some challenges. What are these? Choosing an optimization value of learning rate. If the learning rate is too small, then the gradient descent may take ages to converge. And if it is too high, you might not get the minima ever, right? Have a constant learning rate for all the parameters. There may be some parameters which may not want to change the same rate, right? And may get trapped at a local minima. So these are all the challenges which we can see in all the gradient descent problems. All right. Now comes something which is more advanced than the gradient descent, which is the momentum. Okay. Momentum was invented for reducing the high variance in stochastic gradient descent and softens the convergence. Right. Since it is has high, high variability, it might become that the model becomes more complex, right? So it accelerates the convergence towards the relevant direction and reduces the fluctuations on to the irrelevant direction. So wherever the so it's like a guide for you. So when you are, you know, moving through a pass or a valley to find out some some place, right? Or if you, when you are climbing down, climbing a mountain, you know, to find a valley because obviously you need a valley to reach the city from a mountain, right? So it helps you to find the right direction. So it accelerates the convergence towards the relevant direction and reduces the fluctuations to irrelevant direction. One more hyperparameter is used in the method, which is called symbolized by, uh, we call it chi, okay? 
now the weights are updated you know often so the momentum term is usually set to 0.9 or similar value now the advantage with momentum is that it reduces the oscillations and high variance of the parameters it converges faster than gradient descent obviously because it knows where the minima is and it gives the you know direction to the data set or or, or the particular optimizer so it converges faster than a gradient descent now the disadvantage is that we are obviously using one more hyper parameter which is added and which needs to be manually selected and accurately so whenever we have optimizers or you know hyper parameters which needs to be selected manually it becomes a headache for the data scientist or you know whoever the engineer is because or the researcher is because you have to manually tweak it right to make it better okay now next comes the nestor of uh, accelerated gradient now momentum may be good method but if the momentum is too high the algorithm may miss the local minima and may continue to rise up as i said you know so to resolve this issue the nag algorithm was developed it is look ahead method we know we will be using the uh, a different set of hyper parameter here for modifying the weights right so this will basically tell you the future location now we will calculate the cost based on this future parameter rather than the current one so if you just ignore these terms and te techniques here what it does it it basically you know reduces the momentum of of um, you know um what you can see the acceleration of the the previous optimizer which was momentum right it tries to find out the future location approximately you know but with a better acceleration or deceleration now we calculate the cost based on the future parameter so we will understand it based on what future values which we are going to get with this optimizer right now the advantage with nag is that it does not miss the local minima as i said you know momentum has a high uh, learning rate which is high it might miss the local uh, minima okay so if you don't miss the minimum local minima uh, you won't be able to go to the global minima right it slows if the minima are occurring so whenever it sees that you know a minima is occurring or if you are going through the mountains you know if there is the two mountains if you see that there is one valley you know where you can walk pretty well or we can you can reach the city it actually slows down so it accelerates wherever there is no you know um minima in the vicinity but whenever it sees a minima it you know slows down the disadvantage is that again the hyper parameter needs to be selected manually so not much of a uh, advantage than a momentum optimizer now coming to the next one which is ada grad so those who have you know some knowledge of deep learning they have uh, probably heard of these terms ada grad or adam right so ada grad is again an optimizing techniques but one of the disadvantage of optimizers explained is that the learning rate constant for all the parameters and for each cycle so the learning rate will be you know same for each of the parameters so if you have three input variables x1 x2 and x3 the learning rate will be same for all three x1 x2 and x3 the weight might be different but the learning rate will be same now this optimizer changes the learning rate it changes the learning rate n for each parameter and at every time step t okay it's a type second order optimization algorithm it works on the derivative of an error function so this is not a type 1 it is actually a second order optimization algorithm so it does a double derivation all right now n is the learning rate which is modified for a given parameter at a given time based on previous gradients calculated for 
the given parameter. So what it does it it actually stores the sum of the squares of the gradients with respect to you know the previous error up to a time step t. Now these errors which you see for the difference between the predicted and the actual values is called the smoothing term which avoids division by zero which helps us to find the square root operation and the algorithm performance uh, over the time so don't you don't have to worry about you know this mathematical concept but just try to understand that you know it makes big updates for less frequent parameters and small step for frequent parameters so that's why we have advantages like learning rate changes for each training parameter okay uh, don't need to manually tune the learning rate and is able to train on sparse data so even if you have you know not a densely populated data if you have a sparse data you can train this model you don't have to you know manually adjust the or tune the learning rate so you are you know free from doing it no man manual intervention required to update the learning rates and uh, uh, the disadvantage is that computationally very expensive as uh, need to calculate the second order of derivative obviously we have uh, understood that and as and when the more number of orders of derivative increases it becomes computationally very expensive and the learning rate is always decreasing results in slow training right next we'll move away from ada grad and uh, we'll move to ada delta right so ada delta is an extension of ada grad which tends to remove the decaying learning rate problem of it instead of accumulating all previous squared gradients ada delta limits the window of accumulated past gradients to some fixed window size w so what the problem with ada grad was that it used to you know um accumulate the learning rate of the previous uh, steps okay so the problem with adagrat is that it removes the uh, you know it had decaying learning rate problem so the learning rate you know eventually decreases with time just like we have vanishing gradient right so instead of accumulating all the previous gradi squared gradients ada delta limits the window of accumulated past gradients to some fixed size w so what happens is that uh, for example if i am a human being uh, whatever is taught to me you know in the first class i might not remember it now right probably 3 months back whatever i have taught you you might not remember it now so that is one something called a decaying learning rate problem right it decays over time because we don't remember but if i ask you what i have told you in the last class or taught you in the last class you will probably remember so you don't have that decay right so this is what we call that it accumulates the past gradients to some fixed size w right so it does not you know covers the entire uh, you know set starting from the first um point to the last point okay now the advantage is that now the learning rate does not decay and the training does not stop again the disadvantage is that it's again computationally expensive obviously it is computationally expensive because you are doing the second order uh, derivative now coming to the rescue is adam adam is very popular in um, the optimizers of deep learning so adam is called adaptive moment estimation which works with momentums of first and second order the intuition behind the adam is that we don't want to roll so fast just because we can jump over the minima we want to decrease the velocity a little bit for a careful search in addition to storing an exponentially decaying average of past squared gradients like ada delta adam also keeps an exponentially decaying average of past gradients mt so it also does the same thing okay it has a particular window from where it actually stores the learning rate exponentially decreasing the learning rate because obviously when you are descending from a mountain right and if you don't lower your momentum when when you reach the value you might probably might probably fall or you might you know just skip the local minima and 
try to run through the next mountain or, or try to crawl the next mountain. So what it does, it, it exponentially slows down the decaying rate of the learning parameter. Okay. And it basically uh, it looks into two parts. One is the mean and the variance. Okay. You don't have to go through these uh, calculations and mathematical concepts, but try to understand the value which we generally take is, you know, 0 0.9 or points, uh, 0.999 for beta 1 and beta 2. But the interview will not ask you questions related to this, but rather it will ask, or they will ask you questions related to the advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that the method is too fast and converges rapidly and it rectifies the vanishing rate, learning rate, high variance problem, which we have seen with, you know, um, um, the ADA grad and ADA delta problem. But again, this is computationally uh, very expensive, obviously, because it uses the first order derivative for uh, momentums, right? And second order as well. Now the comparison between the various optimizers. So you can see that these are the various optimizers which you have. You have the stochastic gradient descent. You have something called RMS prop. We'll go through it. And when we talk about CNN, we have Adam, we have Adagrad, and we have uh, Ada Delta. Okay. And you can see that how does this convert? So if this is your local minima, right? It tries to you know move around from one. Uh, uh, one place to the other and uh, if you compare it right so this is your local minima if you compare it which one is you know working better through this we can see that you know the adam one is actually the one which uh, actually has the better learning rate optimizer right it converges at a better pace Right. Whenever it sees that there is a local minima, it tries to converge and then it stays where the local minima is or the global minima is. Right. So this was the comparison of all the optimizers. Now, conclusion is that Adam is the bet best optimizer if one wants to train the neural network in less time and more efficiently than Adam is the than the Adam is the optimizer. So Adam is the best optimizer for whenever you have very less time. Okay. And you want to, you know, optimize your model for sparse data. We can uh, use the optimizers with dynamic learning rate, right? And if you want to use gradient descent algorithm, then a mini, mini batch gradient descent is the best option. So that is what our uh, comparison, comparison of different optimizers work but more to it when we will do this over python we'll implement one cnn algorithm and let's see how these different you know optimizers work and what are the different outputs which we get from each of these optimizers and how different activation functions can be used what are the different use cases of each of these uh, algorithms